this thought uh, was aimed at giving an overview of GPCR dynamics in the context of our project, that is to find a combination of two existing drugs to decrease individual and wanted side effects while keeping or increasing therapeutic effects in chronic pain. G protein copper receptors or GPCR have membrane proteins that transmit the signal embodied in the molecular structure of neurotransmitters, hormones, synthetic ligands, or even photons of light from outside to inside the cell through the interaction of the receptor with a G protein. Here we can see a mechanism. After receptor activation, the following processes occur. The binding of the G protein to the receptor, the exchange of GDP by GTP, the dissociation of alpha and beta gamma subunits of the G protein, and the interaction with the effector system. From a structural point of view, these receptors are composed of seven helices. Here you see the receptor, the seven helices. It's not a planar construction in reality, no? Here is just a representation. It's like a cylinder inserted into the membrane. Here is the membrane of the cell. This is the, the cellular side of the cell where the ligands come and bind the receptor. And in the intracellular side of the receptor inside the cell, the G protein, after activation of the receptor by the ligands, bind the receptor. The G protein is composed of three units. It binds GDP when it is inactive. After binding the receptor, GDP is exchanged by GDP. This activates the G protein. The G protein breaks into G alpha and beta gamma subunits, and then they go to the effector system, and, and we have the, the activation of the effector system, and finally the observed response. The activation of the receptor involves a conformational change, which is more important at transmembrane helix 6 or TM6. Here we have the crystal structure of structures of the beta 2 adrenergic receptor in inactive and active state. Inactive in gray, active in green. After receptor activation, an outward displacement of about 14 astrons of helix 6 is observed. You can see the displacement of TM6, helix 6 of the receptor in the crystal structure after receptor activation, combining the two crystal structures, inactive and active, of the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. GPCRs are dynamic entities. They have constitutive activity through an active conformation stabilized by agonists and the G protein. These receptors present a basal response in the absence of ligands. And this effect is increased by agonists and decreased by inverse agonists. We can see this in the typical pharmacological plot of the variation of the biological response with the concentration of a particular drug in logarithmic units. You have this plot on the right of this slide. You can see on the left of the plot, we have the biological response of the receptor in the absence of the drug. And on the right of the plot, the biological response of the receptor at high drug concentration. The horizontal line, the black one, corresponds to a neutral antagonist because it does not change the basal response of the receptor. Agonists generate a receptor response higher than the basal response, whereas inverse agonists do the contrary. It is worth noting that allostery, a fundamental property in biology by which an effect exerted on one position of a protein is transmitted to another, is an intrinsic property of the GPCR activation mechanism. You can see here in this picture on the right, the allostery that comes from the binding of an agonist in the extracellular part of the receptor, and this binding transmit a signal to a secondary part of, of the receptor in the intracellular bind, and then the G protein can bind. So there is a low state mechanism, which is an intrinsic property of this receptor. Then we will see another allosteric properties of this receptor. Our project is aimed to find a combination of two drugs with the objective of increasing the therapeutic effects and decreasing the unwanted side effects of individual drugs. We chose morphine as a reference drug, and our objective is to find a second drug to improve the pharmacological profile of morphine. Morphine is a chemical compound, and this means that it has a particular chemical structure. Morphine is a potent analgesic, and its pharmacological actions derive mainly from being an agonist of the mu -OP receptor, MOR, a class A GPCR. More agonists are the strongest painkillers, but regretfully they show unwanted side effects, among them respiratory depression and addiction. The potency of morphine has been increased through synthetic compounds, as for instance fentanyl, which is much more potent than morphine. We can see from this structure on the slide that morphine and fentanyl are different in structure. 
Morphine is very compact and fentanyl is elongated, but they have some chemical features in common. The presence of nitrogen atoms that can be protonated, oxygen atoms that can be acceptor or donors of hydrogen bonds, and aromatic and aliphatic rings. However, the number and geometric disposition of these structural features seem very different for these two compounds. We can imagine that an enormous variety of compounds can be synthesized just by playing with these chemical elements. We can also compare the structure of morphine with that of one typical antagonist, natrexone. They are globally similar, but there are some differences in the bond order, red, the position of H bond donors and, and acceptors in blue, and the size of the hydrophobic group in green that should lead to differences in receptor recognition. These differences in the chemical structure of ligands are reflected in the way they are recognized by the receptor. We see here a 2D representation of the recognition of these three ligands by the receptor. The common interaction to all of them is the electrostatic interaction between the protonated, protonated nitrogen of the ligand and a spartic 149 on helix 3. Here we have the same, but in as a 3D representation of fentanyl and morphine within the receptor binding site. These are static pictures of the binding of the ligands to the receptor, but the interaction is dynamic because of the flexibility of the receptor. To analyze how the ligands influence receptor conformation, molecular dynamic simulations can be performed. Molecular dynamic simulations are computational studies, including the receptor, the bound ligand, the membrane, water molecules, lipids, and ions, and a force field to describe the chemical interactions between the chemical entities. Here we see two plots, including two structural properties of the receptor, the motor receptor in axis X and Y, which are different for the crystal structures of three structures, the inactive, activated, and fully active mu opioid receptor. Dark blue, light blue, and green circles correspond to the inactive, activated, and fully active mu opioid receptor crystal structures, respectively. Comparing inactive with active crystal structure, dark blue with green and light blue, we see that activation involves a displacement down and right of these two properties. The small dots on the plots correspond to snapshots taken from the molecular dynamic simulation from morphine on the left and fentanyl on the right, bound to the receptor when we start from the inactive state. We see that fentanyl has a higher propensity than morphine to induce the active conformation of the receptor. This can justify the experimental pharmacological result indicating that fentanyl has higher agonist efficacy than morphine. You can see this in the plot. This is for morphine. We start from the inactive state of the receptor with morphine bound, and then we run the molecular dynamic simulation, and we get snapshots of the simulations at a particular period of time. And from this snapshot, here we measure these two properties, X is X and Y. And here we have the representation of all these situations of the complex and morphine bound to the receptor. And we can see here all these drugs are close to the inactive state. And then there is this part which is relatively more or less close to active states. But this is more clear for fentanyl where the maximum number of results are closer to the active states of the receptor. So this could explain computationally why fentanyl is more potent than morphine. But the problem is more complex than just a simple bimolecular drug, drug, drug receptor interaction. For instance, there can be different receptor ionic species because some residues of the receptor can display different ionic states. This variability can be related with receptor activation. It may happen that the receptor active species is not the major receptor species, but a minor one. We analyzed this problem with opsin receptor of light and found that protonation of some acidic residues favor receptor activation. Another component of the global complexity is the presence of allosteric sites in the receptor structure that can be occupied by small molecules. In a paper that we published recently, we showed the computational identification of allosteric sites that are correlated with the activation of the receptor. This was done for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Another issue is the lipid composition of the membrane. The membrane that can affect the activation of the receptor. In this paper, I'm using, again, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. We showed that lipids can stabilize 
either the inactive or the active state of the receptor, so being part of the activation of the receptor and the function of the receptor. We can consider all these cases um, as examples of allosterism within the receptor, but we can consider a different way of allosterism that gives a new layer of complexity to the problem, receptor-receptor interactions leading to the formation of heteromers. Heteromerization provides a fine-tuning of receptor signaling by activating a novel pathway. Transantagonism, that is the activation of what receptor inhibits the signaling of the other. And transactivation, we can call this to the ability to initiate the signaling cascade of one receptor upon agonist binding to the other protomer. From a structural point of view, a receptor heterodimer is a system composed of two receptors interacting physically through an interface. Bivalent ligands composed of moieties specific of each of the protomers in the heterodimer of each of the receptors with a linker of a particular length can be synthesized. We constructed, in collaboration with a experimental group recently, a heterodimer model of the dopamine D2 and the MGLU5 receptors probe the binding of bivalent ligands of different activities. If there is a good correspondence between the experimental activity observed and the binding of the molecules in the heterodimer model, we can say that this model is consistent with the experimental results. So heterodimers can be realistic. It is important to mention that there is, seems to be a relationship between opioid receptor heteromers and chronic pain as shown by this recently published paper. It was published online the 9th of December. As an example, in this paper, published in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, the authors used bivalent ligands composed of a more agonist and a CB1 antagonist linked by a spacer of different lengths. They found that a compound of a particular length, here with n equal, equal to 7 in this structure, was the most active, indicating an interaction with both receptors at the same time in the heterodimer. Because of the relation of both more and CB1 receptors with pain and the possible existence of heteromers, we aimed at constructing a more CB1 heterodimer model. To do that, the first step is to find interacting interface between the two receptors within the heteromer. As Pedro will show you later, we run a high number of simulations following what is called a coarse grain framework. A preference for particular receptor interfaces was found. The mu opioid receptor can heteromerize with other receptors apart from CB1, as for instance, the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor, as shown by the authors in this paper, morphine binding to the mu opioid receptor triggers a conformational change in the norepinephrine occupied alpha-2A adrenergic receptor that inhibits its signaling to the G protein I and the downstream MAP kinase cascade. As the author said, this data highlight a mechanism in signal transduction whereby a G protein copper receptor heterodimer may give conformational changes that propagate from one receptor to the other and cause the second receptor's rapid inactivation. Another source of complexity comes from the fact that DPCRs signal not only through the G protein, but also through other transducer proteins, such as the beta resting protein. Agonists may favor one or the other signaling pathway, and this is called bias agonism or functional selectivity. In the case that one signaling pathway is associated to the therapeutic effect and the other to unwanted side effects, we need ligand bias in the proper direction. This happens with the mu opioid receptor. Morphine is a balanced agonist acting on both the G protein dependent pathway and the beta resting pathway. It was postulated that the G protein dependent pathway is associated to the therapeutic effect, whereas the beta resting is responsible for the unwanted effects. This is now under debate. It is not clear. There is a lot of controversy about this in the last years. It's a problematic situation with authors going to one side or the other. Nevertheless, there has been a big effort in finding ligands biased towards the G-protein pathway, the one supposed to have the responsibility of the therapeutic effects. And for instance, this we can see here the new compound, the Trevena 130, that was recently approved by the FDA. 
All this complexity leads to a change of paradigm in GPCR signal transduction from vertical, one receptor, one ligand, to horizontal, two interacted receptors through, for instance, receptor heteromerization and combination of two drugs, and from single, one signaling pathway to multiple, various signaling pathways and bias agonisms. We have seen some examples of structural models. Mechanistic mathematical models result from applying the chemical laws that govern the proposed reaction path. There is a correspondence between the equation parameters and the chemical constants of the biological processes. We have constructed a mathematical model for a heterodimeric receptor by translating a previous model of one receptor with allosteric interaction between two sides of a single receptor to a heterodimer with allosteric interaction between the two receptors. Doing this, we can see the change from vertical allostery in the single receptor to horizontal allostery in the heterodimer. On the right, we have a picture of the model. The model is composed of the binding part in the center with four receptor species. The free receptor, the singly bound receptor. The free receptor is R1, R2. This is the symbol. R means receptor, and we have heterodimer, so we use symbols one and two for the two protomers in the heterodimer, the two receptors in the, in the heterodimer. So R1, R2 is the free receptor with no ligand bound. Then we have the singly bound receptor. It, it can be a A, R1, R2. A is the ligand A that binds to the protomer R1, a singly bound receptor. And then we have R1, R2, B, whereas B binds to R2. And then we have the doubly bound receptor with A and B, A bound to R1 and B bound to R2. This is the binding part, and we have the dissociation binding constants, K and M, and alpha, which is a cooperativity factor of binding. We have only three constants because the force depends on the other because we have a thermodynamic cycle. So this is the binding part. And then and the function counts by defining what is called a stimulus. And the stimulus is constructed, defined as the product of the intrinsic efficacy with the concentration of the species that we are considering. We have a stimulus from the free receptor, which is the intrinsic efficacy epsilon multiplied by the concentration for instance, uh, you, we have a stimulus for the four receptor species. The free receptor, the stimulus is a product of the intrinsic efficacy, epsilon, and the, and the concentration of this species. The superscript N comes because we are considering different pathways. So N can be one or two, signaling pathway one or signaling pathway two, because in the heterodimer, we can consider an effect coming from one protomer and an effect coming from the other protomer within the heterodimer. The N in principle, can be one or two, depending on which effect we are considering. So we have a stimulus for all the four species, epsilon n, with the concentration of receptor species, and then, then epsilon b, and the corresponding concentration, epsilon a, and epsilon ab for the doubly bound receptor. We can sum all these four stimulus, and we have then the total stimulus, and then we have an equation, which is a hyperbolic one, for the transformation of a stimulus into the effect. F is a fractional effect, because it's a ratio between the observed effect over the maximum possible effect. M means maximum, M of maximum, and N again corresponds to the effect that we are considering, E1 or E2, any of the two signaling pathways. So the model, as it has been defined, can explain bias agonisms because more than one pathway is considered and can be one or two. Binding and functional cooperativities because we have alpha as a binding cooperativity and in the definition of the intrinsic efficacy of the doubly bond receptor, it appears uh, delta, which is a functional cooperativity. The model can also explain constitutive receptor activity because we are saying that the free receptor provides a stimulus, then the free receptor is able to give a, a functional response. And because of this, we have the basal response, which is defined from the model as this expression that depends on three terms, three parameters, the intrinsic efficacy, of the free receptor, epsilon, and through chi, the total receptor concentration, and key e, e, the term, which is a transducer term here in the function, key e, which is a transducer term from a stimulus to the observed functional response.
Here we have an example to show this. We have different concentration effect curves for pathway two when we are using a collection of parameters. So just by using these parameter values for pathway two here in the red rectangle for the different constants of the model, we obtain all these curves in this plot. We have two ligands, ligand A and ligand B, remember. We have here the left of the plot, and the left of the plot, we have no concentration of ligand A because we are on the left of the plot. We focus on the black line on the left. The black line means that the concentration of B is zero. On the left, we have the basal response, which is over zero, but it is very low. It's the basal response in the absence of both A and B. And it is very low because of the parameters. Eh? We can see that epsilon is 0.1 and chi is 0.2. They are very low. And because this, the basal response is, is very low. Also, on the left, we can go from the black to the violet curve. And we can see that going from the black to the violet, here we see the concentration of B. This means that the concentration of ligand B is increasing. B, what it is, is a positive agonist or is a inverse agonist, what is this? We can conclude that B is a positive agonist because if we increase the concentration of this ligand going from black to violet, the response increases. B is a positive agonist and this is consistent with the value of that we have used for B for the intrinsic efficacy, which is 10, and this is higher than the one for the free receptor that was 0.1 because the intrinsic efficacy of B is higher than that of the free receptor B is a positive agonist and this is reflected in this curve on the left of the plot. But what about A? What can we say about A? Is A a positive or an inverse agonist? We go from the left to the right. This means that the concentration of A is increasing in all of the curves and what we observe is a decrease of the effect. So this means that A should be an inverse agonist. If we look to the intrinsic efficacy here of A that we have used for the representation of these curves, we can see that the intrinsic efficacy of A is 0.01, which is lower than that of the free receptor. And because of this, we can say that A is an inverse agonist, and this is consistent with the values in the plot. We can consider in the previous heterodimer model, we didn't take into account the possibility of that we have also the receptors in the system, independent receptors R1, R2. So we can consider also this and the equilibrium of the heteromerization between the two receptors. We can consider also that we can go from equilibrium constants to rate constants in order to have into account the time dependence of the system. We are doing this. We have done some work in collaboration with some of two colleagues, and we have obtained differential equations and solved the equations analytically for this situation. So we have an equilibrium between the ligand and the receptor, but then it appears the desensitization of the receptor. In order to explain this, this time dependence, we have used rate constants instead of equilibrium constants. We can increase the complexity of the problem working with rate constants instead of equilibrium constants, taking into account the receptor activation here with R star, taking into account the constitutive receptor activity, either by the two-state model or the operational model, here also too, and working with a stimulus on the right, the concept of a stimulus. Here we can see on the right that the R, the free receptor, can provide a stimulus and then can provide a functional effect. So we can apply these ideas to the heterodimer system to work with rate constants too. The conclusion is that we have tried to explain through structural models and mathematical models typical pharmacological topics, efficacy, potency, inverse agonism, cooperativity, allosterism, bias agonism, etc., in the context of receptor heteromerization. And finally, the acknowledgement, many collaborations along years, but here I have uh, put someone in this slide, Amadeu Llevaria, a chemist responsible for some of the molecules that we have used, David Hall, Jose Miguel Vela, and Arthur Christopoulos, with some collaboration on mathematical modeling, Jean-Philippe Pan in Montpellier, with a long collaboration in structural and mathematical models. Alfredo Bellido and Antoni Guillamón at the Universidad Politécnica de Tartaruña, who helped us with much learning and mathematical support. Diego Palau, responsible of psychiatry in one of the university hospitals of our university. I have a collaboration, institutional collaboration with them, not exactly as a patient. And people of my group along various years. And in particular, I would like to say Pedro Reynolds,
now in, in the audience. And the funding resources also, right? because uh, without them, it's impossible to, to make research, to do research. And that's it. Right? Thank you for questions and thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.